Hello, and welcome to the second installment of Grantology, Navigating the World of Funding. My name is Paul Yamano. I'm the Senior Grants Development Specialist for Old Colony Planning Council. Uh, today, we have a full deck of uh, grant opportunities to present to you all, uh, both federal and state, as well as recapping uh, a few things from the, the last webinar. Uh, we really appreciate your time and uh, looking forward to continuing to work with you all on this great endeavor. So again, the purpose of Grantology is really to assist you all um, in identifying opportunities, which I have done in my own personal research, and then getting that information out to you all, and then educating you all through these series of webinars on the different opportunities and some of the nuances that go along with, with these particular grants, whether it's at the state or the federal level. And then finally, to provide assistance to you all as well. Um, I know that having someone with background in grants and grant writing it is certainly important for your community. And that's why I'm here. I'm here to help you all and offer any assistance that I can and whatever that, that particular mean may be. All the information you're about to hear in this webinar can be found on the dedicated Grantology website. Uh, we have bi-weekly newsletters that go out to you all. Uh, if you haven't subscribed already, please do. We certainly really appreciate that. Um, and any additional attachments or addendums to uh, what I'm about to go into today will also be found on the Grantology website. So with that in mind, we'll uh, begin today's session. So I just wanted to give you all a brief overview of um, sort of the grant timeline and how that works. So grants are typically done on a, a schedule, and usually it's done during the seasons. So grants that are open right now in the springtime are usually due in the summer. Grants that open up in the summer are usually due in the fall. And then fall grants that open up in the winter, excuse me, fall grants that are, that are open in the fall are usually due in the winter. So... Uh, grants are on a seasonal cycle. I uh, just wanted to share that just in case um, you folks are curious about that. So uh, the first set of business I wanted to get into today was um, just to, again, thank our panelists that attended the electric vehicle plant panel discussion back on May 6th. So uh, for those of you that didn't get a chance to watch it, uh, feel free to click the QR code here contained in the slide. Uh, we had various experts from the Green Energy Consumers, Department of Energy Resources, National Grid and Eversource, as well as the Clean Cities Coalition, um, speak to you all about navigating an often complex and tricky um, field and really understanding the incentives that are out there for folks looking to get an electric vehicle in their communities, as well as on a personal level. Uh, maybe for your business as well. Um, certainly there are a lot of incentives out there in, in different programs that were discussed at length. Uh, and that was a, uh, again, a great opportunity for you all. And I again, encourage you to watch the recording. Um, to add a little bit to that in, in this webinar, uh, there are several state and federal grant programs that communities and other entities can take advantage of um, through both the federal government and the state government. One in particular is the Accelerating Clean Transportation Act School Bus Fleet Deployment Program. I know it's a mouthful. Um, so this grant is offering $2 million for eligible entities to essentially replace their fleet school buses with, with EV school buses. And that inc also includes retrofits. So it's not only full replacement, but retrofit. Uh, this program is great because not only does it provide you with the actual vehicles and infrastructure for charging, but it provides you with um, the ability to have a technical expert to come in and help you with things like equipment selection and how to get through the state business list. 
uh, procurement, and then obviously project implementation that comes along with this. So it's it's wonderful that this program offers those opportunities for you. Um, this program offers up to, again, $2 million uh, with a deadline of June 24th of 2024, uh, coming up very quickly. Um, so eligibility comes in multiple different forms. So you can apply as a Massachusetts Public School District on your own, or if you partner with a private company as a school district, so the public-private partnership, you're eligible for this program, or if you have a, or if you're a private company and you're looking to partner with a public entity, you are also eligible for this program. So a minimum of um, electrification required for this program are three uh, battery electric vehicle school buses. So if you're looking to, you can either change out your entire fleet or you can do a minimum of three. And again, that comes with the associated charging infrastructure as well. Um, this particular program does prioritize certain communities that are on the EPA's priority list. Uh, unfortunately, none of the communities in our region are on this list. However, that should not deter you from applying for this grant as um, it's still highly competitive and, and advantageous um, even for folks that are not on this list. So a federal program now um, is the Clean Heavy Duty Vehicles Grant. So this is a fairly new program through the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, this program is appropriating a billion dollars to replace non-zero emission heavy duty vehicles with zero emissions. Um, and this grant in particular focuses on class six and class seven heavy duty vehicles, which are defined in the Notice of Funding Opportunity. Um, within this program, it offers not only the opportunity to replace your fleet, but there are workforce development and training, as well as implementation costs that are associated with this program. So um, there are several different components to the Clean Heavy Duty Vehicle Grant, um, including the cost share that is associated with the purchase of the vehicles, depending on which class six or seven vehicle you are looking to replace. So for example, for school buses, EPA will cover for the battery electric vehicles up to the $60 million cap that's allotted under this program, which is a significant amount of money. However, you can only apply for up to 280,000. So if you know, the vehicle you're looking to replace is 300,000, or I should say the school bus, then there are some out-of-pocket costs that'll be associated with that. Um, and then there is also a cap for hydrogen fuel cell vehicles, if you so choose to go in that direction. Um, so the list here, we have straight box trucks, step vans, septic or bucket trucks um, for DPWs, um, any other vocational vehicle uh, for your refuse department, you can replace your refuse hauler, street sweeper, or even if you're a transit agency, you can replace your transit bus under this program. But again, keeping in mind that there are caps on the amount that you can spend per vehicle. So um, within the notice funding opportunity, just keep that in mind. Uh, something else to keep in mind as well with this program is um, there are very specific requirements in terms of the age of the vehicles, um, as well as what you have to do to remove the vehicles out of your fleet. So the EPA has a very specific scrapping process for your vehicle. Um, and I encourage you to read the Notice of Funding Opportunity, which goes into detail as to how to do that and best practices for that. So this is, a again, another wonderful program that's available to you all as it relates to clean and green infrastructure and as well as electric vehicles. Um, I do wanna mention another few programs that are available for you all. Um, this includes the Charging Fueling Infrastructure Grant, uh, which currently doesn't have an open availability, uh, but should be coming soon in late 2024 and early 2025. So the Charging Fueling Infrastructure Grant is a federal program that's available 
for two different things, either corridor charging, which is in relation to the alternative fuel vehicle corridors, or excuse me, the alternative fuel corridors that are available, um, which is basically your major highways and interstates, right? So Route 24, I-495, et cetera. So um, the federal government is focused on sort of making sure that for every 50 miles that is traveled within the state of Massachusetts, that individuals have access to an electric vehicle charging station. So this program supports uh, charging along those corridors, but also community charging to install EV charging stations in publicly accessible places. So this program will allow municipalities to be able to do that, as well as nonprofit agencies. Um, it's a wonderful program. Uh, last year, they were offering up to $15 million in funding with a 20% match. So something to keep in mind if, if folks are interested in applying for a charging filling infrastructure grant. Another opportunity that folks can take advantage of is through the National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Program, or known as NEVI. So uh, the federal government uh, put this out to states in particular to apply for, to develop deployment plans related to these alternative fuel corridors. So for Massachusetts, they developed a plan, and I encourage you all to go onto their website, and we'll provide a link to that plan in the Grantology page to take a look at uh, what Massachusetts is doing for alternative fuel corridors and the plans that they have for that. Um, through this program, there was a 10% set aside for municipalities. And uh, again, most recent news has indicated that on, uh, excuse me, that in the month of June, there'll be uh, a notice of funding opportunity released for municipalities to take advantage of their own um, electric vehicle needs. So um, based on the current federal standards and the Massachusetts plan, um, it is indicated that this will be a one mile corridor radius around uh, the major intersections and corridors. So for our region, that would be Route 24 um, and, and some of the surrounding interstates. So uh, please stay tuned to that and I'll let you all know as soon as uh, I hear more on uh, plans for deploying that, um, that notice. And then um, there were also several Inflation Reduction Act credits. Uh, I know that in the EV webinar that was discussed a bit, but just wanted to folks let folks know that there are um, what are called uh, elective pay or direct pay credits that are available. Uh, this is called the 30C process. So essentially there are um, certain elective credits that municipalities, uh, businesses, nonprofits can take advantage of related to EV projects or clean energy projects that they're working on. Uh, this is all done through the IRS and there's a direct credit elective form that gets filled out. So we'll, uh, we'll provide more links to that um, and there'll be more information as it becomes available on how to access them. But just wanted to make you folks aware that that is out there if you're interested in um, an electric vehicle future and electric vehicle infrastructure. So those are some of the, um, the EV programs that are available currently. Uh, just going back really quick to the Clean Heavy Duty Vehicle Program. Uh, again, the award range is up to $60 million, uh, but the award minimum is 500,000 and applications for this program are due on July 25th. So again, encourage you all to apply for that. All right, so another federal program that is available and actually has been out for a few cycles now is the Strengthening Mobility and Revolutionizing Technology or affectionately known as the SMART Grant Program. So this is done in two stages. So we are at the stage one planning phase. This is actually the third cycle of the stage one planning phase for folks. Uh, for those that have already received a stage one planning grant, um, the city of Brockton in particular, uh, would be eligible to apply for a stage two, which is taking your prototype uh, in the stage one and doing implementation of that in stage two. 
So for folks just applying for stage one, this is really a prototype slash pilot program to carry out specific transportation projects related to connected and smart technologies. So there is a wide range of eligibility when it comes to the smart program. And this involves coordinated automation as it relates to EV and autonomous vehicles, um, intelligent based sensors to be able to collect real time traffic data on the ground. Uh, there is systems integration that is associated with that. So the uh, GPS data that is located on the, the traffic signals um, is eligible for this as well. Uh, logistics and freight is also another big component and another way to communicate um, with what's going out, what's going on on the ground. Um, smart grid technologies is also um, eligible into this program. And again, um, for folks interested in replacing outdated traffic technology with something that is going to provide um, meaningful data and something that can be scalable and replicable for other communities. Um, I certainly encourage you to apply for this program. It is a one to two year pilot and folks that apply for this at stage one or again would be eligible for a stage two implementation. Uh, there is no match associated with this. Um, the award for stage one is up to $2 million. The max for stage two hasn't been set yet, but that will be coming shortly. Uh, and applications are going to be due on July 12th uh, by five o'clock. So really encourage you to apply for this as well. It's a wonderful opportunity and is a great bipartisan infrastructure law federal grant. All right, again, uh, today's webinar can be found on the Grantology website. Um, and any additional information that I've talked about, as well as links and uh, other supporting documentation will be found here. Uh, I did want to add a few more things to the discussion today, including a few more grants that I come across that I'd like to share with you all. Um, one of them is the FY24 Comprehensive Opioid Stimulant and Substance Use Site-Based Program, or HOPE is the acronym. So this is through the Bureau of Justice Assistance, and this provides municipalities and nonprofit agencies with uh, funding to help with folks suffering some, from substance use disorder. Um, it's a great opportunity to do prevention harm training, uh, provide treatment, um, as well as working in concert with, with law enforcement. So um, it's a program that is open now. There are different subcategories depending on where you're located within the region. So if you're in an urban area, you're eligible for up to 1.6 million through the program. Suburban areas are eligible for up to 1.3, and then rural areas can apply for up to a million dollars. There is no match required under this program, which is great. Um, and there are essentially two portions to this that get submitted at different times. So on July 1st, your federal forms get submitted in grants.gov so that your 424 and required attachments. And then on July 8th, your full narrative is due in Just Grants. And for those unfamiliar with Just Grants, it's the platform for the Bureau of Justice Assistance, similar to grants.gov, um, dedicated to, to these type of grants. So um, again, two parts, uh, making sure you get your federal forms in by the 1st of July, and then on the 8th, your actual narrative for the program. So for those that offer substance use services and are looking for funding for your program, this would be a great opportunity. Another federal grant I wanted to run by you all is the Active Transportation Infrastructure Investment Program, or ATIP. So this provides municipalities an opportunity to do projects within an active transportation network. And what's meant by that is, um, so that includes updating bicycle paths, pedestrian paths, uh, trails. So anything that connects folks to a transportation network, 
and uh, implementing what's called the complete street strategy that uh, focuses on um, safer, cleaner driving and um, making sure that uh, folks are aware of the national roadway safety strategy and we're implementing a future where there are zero roadway fatalities. So this is a, a program that is offered for developing and enhancing either new or existing active transportation networks, but also this concept of ac active transportation spines or connecting different communities within the region or connecting regions together. So not only can you do an individualized application, but you can work with other regional partners. And through this grant, there are two different tracks. So there is a planning and design grant program, and there's also a construction program. So the planning and design grants range from 100,000 to up to $2 million, and that's a two-year grant. Uh, construction grants are capped at a minimum of $15 million, and that's done over a five-year period. So what's great about this program is folks can actually apply for both simultaneously if they choose. The only thing you have to remember is that it has to be two different projects. So you can apply for one corridor in specific for a planning grant that may not yet be ready and you need to get up to 25% design. Or you may have a project that's more shovel ready that you simultaneously want to apply for this year that you can do on the construction side. So you have a, a range of options this one. And I you know, encourage you all to apply for this. Uh, the deadline is upcoming. So if you're interested, um, it's due on June 17th. So fast approaching. And then lastly, I have a state grant that was just released for those interested in doing a an ADA transition plan. So um, that is available through the state right now. Um, you can apply for anywhere from $3,000 up to $250,000. There is no match for this. And it's to do one of two things. So you can either apply to do an actual ADA transition plan or self-evaluation plan, or you, for those that already have one in place, you can actually apply for implementation funds to do what has been designated in the plan. But for folks just um, getting through the process and doing this for the first time, um, you are required to do a few steps um, prior to actually putting in an application. So one of those steps is designating uh, an employee who will be your local ADA coordinator, um, establishing uh, a notice of your current ADA requirements, if you have any, um, establishing an ADA grievance procedure, uh, which is outlined on the state website. Um, and then from there, um, you can work to establish a self-evaluation and ADA plan. So as long as you have the three initial components, you can apply for this program. Um, once you apply and get the funding, you can then work to develop your either self-evaluation and transition plan. Um, after that's complete, there's usually a 30 to 60 day public comment period. Uh, once that's complete, uh, your report is then sent to the state, which they will then evaluate. And then from there, um, if the plan is approved, uh, you can then apply for implementation funding uh, shortly thereafter. Um, and that will help to implement some of the recommendations that were uh, provided in that plan. So this is another one I highly encourage you all to take advantage of. And it's um, it's out now. And the application deadline is upcoming. So I uh, will provide all of those details on the website for you, including the uh, upcoming due date. So that concludes this second session of Grantology. Uh, I really appreciate your time and, and listening. Uh, to get in touch with me, my email address is here on the screen, and my cell phone number is available as well. Please don't hesitate to reach out to me. I'm here to help you all in any way that I can, and uh, definitely looking forward to continuing this series and uh, getting into more of the weeds on some of um, 
the topics that uh, are covered within uh, different grant opportunities uh, related to procurement, um, as well as several others. So um, this is just going to be the first of many. And uh, thank you again for your attention. And uh, I will see you next time. Take care.